The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these, and share liberally. Part 8 The universe, as has been observed before, is an unsettlingly big place, a fact for which, for the sake of a quiet life, most people tend to ignore. Many would happily move to somewhere rather smaller of their own devising, and this is what most beings in fact actually do. For instance, in one corner of the eastern galactic arm lies the large forest planet Oglaroon, the entire intelligent population of which lives permanently in one fairly small and crowded nut tree. In which tree they are born, live, fall in love, carve tiny speculative articles in the bark on the meaning of life, the futility of death and the importance of birth control, fight a few extremely minor wars, and eventually die strapped to the underside of some of the less accessible outer branches. In fact, the only Oglarunians who ever leave their tree are those who are hurled out of it for the heinous crime of wondering whether any of the other trees might be capable of supporting life at all, or indeed whether the other trees are anything other than illusions brought on by eating too many ogler nuts. Exotic, though this behaviour may seem, there is no life form in the galaxy which is not in some way guilty of the same thing. Which is why the total perspective vortex is as horrific as it is. For when you are put into the vortex, you are given just one momentary glimpse of the entire unimaginable infinity of creation. And somewhere in it, a tiny little marker, a microscopic dot on a microscopic dot, which says, You are here. The grey plain stretched before Zaphod, a ruined, shattered plain. The wind whipped wildly over it. Visible in the middle was the steel pimple of the dome. This, gathered Zaphod, was where he was going. This was the total perspective vortex. As he stood and gazed bleakly at it, a sudden inhuman wail of terror emanated from it, as if of a man having his soul burnt from his body. It screamed above the wind and died away. Zaphod stared with fear, and his blood seemed to turn to liquid helium. Hey, what was that? he muttered voicelessly. A recording, said Gagravar, of the last man who was put into the vortex. It is always played to the next victim, a sort of prelude. Hey, it sounds really bad, stammered Zaphod. Couldn't we uh, maybe slope off to a party or something for some for a while and think it over? For all I know said Gagravar's ethereal voice. I'm probably at one. My body, that is. It goes to a lot of parties without me. Says I only get in the way. Hey-ho. What is all this with your body? said Zaphod, anxious to delay whatever it was going to happen, whatever it was that was going to happen to him. Well, it's, um, it's busy, you know said Gagravar hesitantly. Y- you mean it's it's got a mind of its own? said Zaphod. There was a long and slightly chilly pause before Gagravar spoke again. I have to say, he replied eventually, that I find that remark in rather poor taste. 
Zaphod muttered a bewildered and embarrassed apology. No matter, said Gagravar, you weren't to know. The voice fluttered unhappily. The truth is, it continued in tones which suggested he was trying very hard to keep it under control. The truth is that we are currently undergoing a period of legal trial separation. I suspect it will end in divorce. The voice was still again, leaving Zaphod with no idea of what to say. He mumbled uncertainly. I think we were probably not very well suited, said Gagravar again at length. We never seemed to be happy doing the same things. We always had the greatest arguments over sex and fishing. Eventually we tried to combine the two, but that only led to disaster, as you can probably imagine. And now my body refuses to let me in. It won't even see me. He paused again, tragically. The wind whipped across the plain. It says I only inhibit it. I pointed out that, that, in fact, I was meant to inhabit it, and it said that that was exactly the sort of smart Alec remark that got right up a body's left nostril, so we left it. It'll probably get custody of my forename. Oh, said Zaphod faintly. And what's that? Pizpot, said the voice. My name is... Pizpot Gagravar says it all, really, doesn't it? Uh, said Zaphod sympathetically. And that is why I, as a disembodied mind, have this job, custodian of the total perspective vortex. No one will ever walk on the ground of this planet except the victims of the vortex. They don't really count, I'm afraid. Huh? I'll tell you the story. Would you like to hear it? Huh? Many years ago, this was a thriving, happy planet. People, cities, shops, a normal world, except that on the, on the high streets of these cities, there were slightly more shoe shops than one might have thought entirely necessary. Slowly, insidiously, the numbers of these shoe shops were increasing. It's a well-known economic phenomenon, but tragic to see it in operation, for the more shoe shops there were, the more shoes they had to make, and the worse and more unwearable they became. The worse they were to wear, the more people, sorry, and the worse they were to wear, the more people had to buy themselves to keep themselves shod, and the more the shops proliferated until the whole economy of the place passed what I believe is termed the shoe event horizon, and it became no longer economically possible to build anything other than shoe shops. Result? Collapse, ruin, and famine. Most of the population died out. Those few who had the right kind of genetic instability mutated into birds, you've seen one of them, who cursed their feet, cursed the ground, and vowed that no one should walk on it ever again. Unhappy lot. Come, I must take you to the vortex. Zaphod shook his heads in bemusement and stumbled forward across the plain. And uh, you, he said, you come from this hellhole pit, do you? No, no, said Gagravar, taken aback. I come from the Frogstar World Sea. Beautiful place, wonderful fishing. I flit back there in the evenings, though all I can do now is watch. The total perspective vortex is the only thing on this planet with any function. It was built here because no one else wanted it on their doorstep. At that moment, another dismal scream rent the air, and Zaphod shuddered. What can that do to a guy? he breathed. The universe, said Gagravar simply, the whole infinite universe, the infinite suns, the infinite distances between them, 
and yourself, an invisible dot on an invisible dot, infinitely small. Hey, I'm Zaphod Beeblebrugs, man, you know, muttered Zaphod, trying to flap the last remnants, flatter the, the last remnants of his ego. Gagravar made no reply, but merely resumed his mournful humming until they reached the tarnished steel dome in the middle of the plain. As they reached it, a door hummed open in the side, revealing a small, darkened chamber within. Enter, said Gagravar. Zaphod started with fear. Hey, what now? he said. Now. Zaphod peered nervously inside. The chamber was very small. It was steel-lined, and there was hardly space in it for more than one man. It uh, doesn't look like any kind of vortex to me, said Zaphod. It isn't, said Gagravar. It's just the elevator. Enter. With infinite trepidation, Zaphod stepped into it. He was aware of Gagravar being in the elevator with him, though the disembodied man was not, for the moment, speaking. The elevator began its descent. I must get this, get myself into the right frame of mind for this, muttered Zaphod. There is no right frame of mind, said Gagravar sternly. You really know how to make a guy feel inadequate. I don't. The vortex does. At the bottom of the shaft, the rear of the elevator opened up, and Zaphod stumbled out into a smallish, functional, steel-lined chamber. At the far side of it stood a single, upright steel box, just large enough for a man to stand in. It was that simple. It connected to a small pile of components and instruments via a single, thick wire. Is that it? said Zaphod in surprise. That is it. Didn't look too bad, thought Zaphod. And I get in there, do I? said Zaphod. You get in there, said Gagravar. And I'm afraid you must do it now. OK, OK, said Zaphod. He opened the door of the box and stepped in. Inside the box, he waited. After five seconds, there was a click. And the entire universe was there in the box with him. The total perspective vortex derives its picture of the whole universe on the principle of extrapolated matter analyses. To explain, since every piece of matter in the universe is in some way affected by every other piece of matter in the universe, it is in theory possible to extrapolate the whole of creation, every sun, every planet, their orbits, their composition and their economic and social history from, say, one small piece of fairy cake. The man who invented the total perspective vortex did so basically in order to annoy his wife. Trintragula, for that was his name, was a dreamer, a thinker, a speculative philosopher, or, as his wife would have it, an idiot. As she would nag him incessantly about the utterly inordinate amount of time he spent staring out into space, or mulling over the mechanics of safety pins, or doing spectrographic analyses of pieces of fairy cake, have some sense of proportion, she would say, sometimes as often as 38 times in a single day. And so he built the total perspective vortex just to show her. And into one end, he, pl he plugged the whole of reality as extrapolated from a piece of fairy cake, and into the other end, he plugged his wife. 
so that when he turned it on, she saw in one instant the whole infinity of creation and herself in relation to it. To Trintragula's horror, the shock completely annihilated her brain. But to his satisfaction, he realised that he had proved conclusively that if life is going to exist in a universe of this size, then the one thing it cannot afford to have is a sense of proportion. The door of the vortex swung open. From his disembodied mind, Gagravar watched dejectedly. He had rather liked Zaphod Beevilbrox in a strange sort of way. He was clearly a man of many qualities, even if they were mostly bad ones. He waited for him to flop forwards out of the box, as they all did. Instead, he stepped out. Hi, he said. People, Brox, gasped Gagravar's mind in amazement. Can I have a drink, please? said Zaphod. You, you, you have been in the vortex, stammered Gagravar. You saw me, kid. A and it was working? Sure was. And you saw the whole infinity of creation? Sure. Really neat place, you know that? Gagravar's mind was reeling in astonishment. Had his body been with him, it would have sat down heavily with its mouth hanging open. And you saw yourself, said Gagravar, in relation to it all? Oh, yeah, yeah. But what did you experience? Zaphod shrugged smugly. It just told me what I knew all the time. I'm a really terrific and great guy. Didn't I tell you, baby? I'm Zaphod Beeblebrox. His gaze passed over the machinery which powered the vortex and suddenly stopped, startled. He breathed heavily. Hey, he said. Is that really a piece of fairy cake? He ripped the small piece of confectionery from the sensors to which, with which it was surrounded. If I told you how much I needed this, he said ravenously, I wouldn't have time to eat it. He ate it. A short while later, he was running across the plain in the direction of the ruined city. The dank air wheezed heavily in his lungs, and he frequently stumbled with the exhaustion he was still feeling. Night was beginning to fall too, and the rough ground was treacherous. The elation of his recent experience was still with him, though. The whole universe. He had seen the whole universe stretching to infinity around him. Everything and with it had come the clear and extraordinary knowledge that he was the most important thing in it. Having a conceited ego is one thing. Actually being told by a machine is another. He didn't have time to reflect on this matter. Gagravar had told him that he would have to alert his masters as to what had happened, but that he was prepared to leave a decent interval before doing so. Enough time for Zaphod to make a break and find somewhere to hide. What he was going to do, he didn't know, but feeling that he was the most important person in the universe gave him the confidence to believe that something would turn up. Nothing else on this blighted planet could give him much grounds for optimism. He ran on and soon reached the outskirts of the abandoned city. He walked along cracked and gaping roads, riddled with scrawny weeds, the holes filled with rotting shoes. The buildings he passed were so crumbled and decrepit, he thought it unsafe to enter any of them. Where could he hide? He hurried on. 
After a while, the remains of a wide sweeping road led off from the one down on which he was walking, and at its end lay a vast low building surrounded with sundry smaller ones, the whole surrounded by the remains of a perimeter barrier. The large main building still seemed reasonably solid, and Zaphod turned off to see if it might provide him with, well, with anything. He approached the building. Along one side of it, the front, it would seem, since it faded, since it faded a wide, sorry, since it faced a wide concreted apron area, were three gigantic doors, maybe sixty feet high. The far one of these was open, and towards this Zaphod ran. Inside. All was gloom, dust and confusion. Giant cobwebs lay over everything. Part of the infrastructure of the building had collapsed. Part of the rear wall had caved in, and a thick, choking dust lay inches deep over the floor. Through the heavy gloom, shapes loomed, covered with debris. The shapes were sometimes cylindrical, sometimes bulbous, sometimes like eggs or rather cracked eggs, as most of them were split open or falling apart. Some were mere skeletons. They were all spacecraft. They were all derelict. Zaphod wandered in frustration amongst the hulks. There was nothing here that remotely approached the serviceable. Even the mere vibration of his footsteps caused one precarious wreck to collapse further into itself. Towards the rear of the building lay one old ship, slightly larger than the others, and buried beneath even deeper piles of dust and cobwebs. Its outline, however, seemed unbroken. Zaphod approached it with interest, and as he did so, he tripped over an old feed line. He tried to toss the feed line aside, and to his surprise, discovered that it was still connected to the ship. To his utter astonishment, he realised that the feed line was also humming slightly. He stared at the ship in disbelief, and then back down at the feed line in his hands. He tore off his jacket and threw it aside. Crawling along on his hands and knees, he followed the feed line to the point where it connected with the ship. The connection was sound, and the slight humming vibration was more distinct. His heart was beating fast. He wiped away some grime and laid an ear against the ship's side. He could hear only a faint, indeterminate noise. He rummaged feverishly amongst the debris lying on the floor all about him, and found a short length of tubing and a non-biodegradable plastic cup. Out of this he fashioned a crude stethoscope, and placed it against the side of the ship. What he heard made his brains turn somersaults. The voice said, Transstellar Cruise Lines would like to apologise to passengers for the continuing delay to this flight. We are currently awaiting the loading of our complement of small, lemon-soaked paper napkins for your comfort, refreshment and hygiene during the journey. Meanwhile, we thank you for your patience. The cabin crew will shortly be serving coffee and biscuits again. Zaphod staggered backwards, staring wildly at the ship. He walked around for a few moments in a daze. In so doing, he suddenly caught sight of a giant departure board still hanging, but only by one support from the ceiling above him. It was covered with grime, but some of the figures were still discernible. Zaphod's eyes searched amongst the figures, then made some brief calculations, and his eyes widened. Nine hundred years, he breathed to himself. That's how late the ship was. Two minutes later, he was on board. 
As he stepped out of the airlock, the air that greeted him was cool and fresh. The air conditioning was still working. The lights were still on. He moved out of the small entrance chamber into a short, narrow corridor and stepped nervously down it. Suddenly a door opened and a figure stepped out in front of him. Please return to your seat, sir, said the android stewardess, and turning her back on him, she walked down the corridor in front of him. With his heart, sorry, when his heart had started beating again, he followed her. She opened the door at the end of the corridor and walked through. He followed her through the door. They were now in the passenger compartment, and Zaphod's heart stopped still again for a moment. Every seat had a passenger sat in it, strapped into his or her seat. The passenger's hair was long and unkempt, their fingernails were long, and the men wore beards. All of them were quite clearly alive, but sleeping. Zaphod had the creeping horrors. He walked slowly down the aisle as in a dream. By the time he was halfway down the aisle, the stewardess had reached the other end. She turned and spoke. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, she said sweetly. Thank you for bearing with us during this slight delay. We will be taking off as soon as we possibly can. If you would like to wake up now, I will serve you coffee and biscuits. There was a slight hum, and at that moment all the passengers awoke. They awoke screaming and clawing at the straps and life support systems that held them tightly in their seats. They screamed and bawled and hollered until Zaphod thought his ears would shatter. They struggled and writhed as the stewardess patiently moved up the aisle, placing a small cup of coffee and a packet of biscuits in front of each one of them. Then one rose from his seat. He turned and looked at Zaphod. Zaphod's skin was crawling all over his body as if it was trying to get off. He turned and ran from the bedlam. He plunged through the door and back into the corridor. The man pursued him. He raced in a frenzy to the end of the corridor, through the entrance chamber and beyond. He arrived on the flight deck, slammed and bolted the door behind him. He leant back against the door, breathing hard. Within seconds, a hand started beating on the door. From somewhere on the flight deck, a metallic voice addressed him. Passengers are not allowed on the flight deck. Please return to your seat and wait for the ship to take off. Coffee and biscuits are being served. This is your autopilot speaking. Please return to your seat. Zaphod said nothing. He breathed hard. Behind him, the hand continued to knock on the door. Please return to your seat, repeated the autopilot. Passengers are not allowed on the flight deck. I'm not a passenger, panted Zaphod. Please return to your seat. I am not a passenger, shouted Zaphod again. Please return to your seat. I am not a... Hello, can you hear me? Please return to your seat. You're the autopilot, said Zaphod. Yes, said the voice from the flight console. You're in charge of this ship? Yes, said the voice again. There has been a delay. Passengers are to be kept temporarily in suspended animation for their comfort and convenience. Coffee and biscuits are being served every year, after which passengers are returned to suspended animation for their continued comfort and convenience. Departure will take place when the flight stores are complete. We apologize for the delay. Zaphod moved away from the door, on which the pounding had now ceased. He approached the flight console. Delay, he cried. Have you seen the world outside this ship? It's a wasteland, a desert. Civilization's all gone, man. And there are no lemon-soaked paper napkins on the way from anywhere. 
The statistical likelihood, continued the autopilot primly, is that other civilizations will arise. There will be one day lemon-soaked paper napkins. Until then, there will be a short delay. Please return to your seat. But... But at that moment, the door opened. Zaphod spun round to see a man who had pursued him standing there. He carried a large briefcase. He was smartly dressed, and his hair was short. He had no beard and no long fingernails. Zephod Beevilbrox, he said. My name is Zoniwoop. I believe you wanted to see me. Zephod Beevilbrox wittered. His mouths said foolish things. He dropped heavily into a chair. Oh, man! Oh, man! Where, where did you spring from? He said. I have been waiting here for you, he said in a business-like tone. He put the briefcase down and sat in another chair. I am glad you followed instructions, he said. I was a bit nervous that you might have left my office by the door rather than the window. Then you would have been in trouble. Zaphod shook his heads at him and burbled. When you entered the door of my office, you entered my electronically synthesized universe, he explained. If you had left by the door, you would have been back in the real one. The artificial one works from here. He patted the briefcase smugly. Zaphod glared at him with resentment and loathing. What's the difference? he muttered. Nothing, said Zaniwoop. They are identical. Oh, except I think that the Frogstar fighters are grey in the real universe. What's going on? spat Zaphod. Simple, said Zaniwoop. His self-assurance and smugness made Zaphod seethe. Very simple, repeated Zaniwoop. I discovered the coordinates at which this man could be found, the man who rules the universe, and discovered that his world was protected by an unprobability field. To protect my secret and myself, I retreated to the safety of this totally artificial universe and hid myself away in a forgotten cruise liner. I was secure. Meanwhile, you and I... You and I? said Zaphod angrily. You, you mean I knew you? Yes, said Zaniwoop. We knew each other well. I had no taste, said Zaphod, and resumed a sullen silence. Meanwhile, you and I arranged that you would steal the improbability drive ship, the only one which could reach the ruler's world, and bring it here to me. This you have now done, I trust, and I congratulate you. He smiled, a tight little smile, which Zaphod wanted to hit with a brick. Oh, and in case you were wondering, added Zaniwoop, this universe was created specifically for you to come to. You are, therefore, the most important person in this universe. You would never, he said with an even more brickable smile, have survived the total perspective vortex in the real one. Shall we go? Where? said Zaphod sullenly. He felt collapsed. To your ship, the heart of gold. You did bring it, I trust. No. 
Where is your jacket? Zaphod looked at him in mystification. My, my jacket? I, I took it off. It's outside. Good. We will go and find it. Zani Whoop stood up and gestured to Zaphod to follow him. Out in the entrance chamber again, they could hear the screams of the passengers being fed coffee and biscuits. It has not been a pleasant experience waiting for you, said Zani Whoop. Not pleasant for you, bawled Zaphod. How do you think? Zani Whoop held up a silencing finger as the hatchway swung open. A few feet away from them, they could see Zaphod's jacket lying in the debris. A very remarkable and very powerful ship, said Zani Whoop. Watch. As they watched, the pocket on the jacket suddenly bulged. It split. It ripped. The small metal model of the heart of gold that Zaphod had been utterly bewildered to discover in his pocket was now growing. It grew. It continued to grow. It reached, after two minutes, its full size. At an improbability level, said Zani Whoop of, oh, I don't know, but something very large. Zaphod swayed. You mean I, I had it with me all the time? Zani Whoop smiled. He lifted up his briefcase and opened it. He twisted a single switch inside it. Goodbye, artificial universe, he said. Hello, real one. The scene before them shimmered briefly, and then reappeared exactly as before. You see, said Zani Whoop, exactly the same. You mean, repeated Zaphod somewhat tautly, that I had it with me all the time. Oh, yes, said Zani Whoop, of course. That was the whole point. That's it, said Zaphod. You can count me out. From here on in, you can count me out. I have had all I wanted this. You play your own games. I'm afraid you cannot leave, said Zani Whoop. You are entwined in the improbability field. You cannot escape. He smiled that smile that Zaphod had wanted to hit. And this time, Zaphod hit it. Quick cup of tea. Slap. Ford Prefect bounded up to the bridge of the Heart of Gold. Trillion! Arthur! he shouted. It's working! The ship's reactivated! Trillian and Arthur were asleep on the floor. Come on, you guys, we're going, we're off, he said, kicking them awake. Hi there, guys, twittered the computer. It's really great to be back with you again, I can tell you, and I just wanted to say that shut up, said Ford, and tell us where the hell we are. Frogstar World B, and man, it's a dump said Zaphod, running onto the bridge. Hi, guys, you must be so amazingly glad to see me, and you can't even find words to tell me what a cool fruit I am. What a what? said Arthur blearily, picking himself up from the floor and not taking any of this in. I know how you feel, said Zaphod. I'm so great, I even get tongue-tied talking to myself. Hey, it's good to see you, Trillian, Ford, Monkey Man. Hey, er, computer. Hi there, Mr. Beeblebrack, sir. It sure is a great honor to shut up and get us out of here. Fast, fast, fast. Sure thing, feller. Where'd you want to go? Anywhere. Doesn't matter, shouted Zaphod. Yes, it does, he said again. We want to go to the nearest place to eat. Sure thing, said the computer happily, and a massive explosion rocked the bridge. 
When Zani Whoop entered a minute or so later with a black eye, he regarded the four wisps of smoke with interest. Four inert bodies sank through spinning blackness. Consciousness had died. Cold oblivion pulled the bodies down and down into the pit of unbeing. The roar of silence echoed dismally around them, and they sank at last into a dark and bitter sea of heaving red that slowly engulfed them, seemingly forever. After what seemed an eternity, the seas receded and left them lying on a cold, hard shore. The flotsam and jetsam of the stream of life, the universe, and everything. Cold spasms shook them. Lights danced sickeningly around them. The cold, hard shore tipped and spun and then stood still. It shone darkly. It was a very highly polished, cold, hard shore. A green blur watched them disapprovingly. It coughed. <clears throat> uh, good evening, madam, gentlemen, it said. Do you have a reservation? Ford Prefect's consciousness snapped back like elastic, making his brain smart. He looked up woozily at the green blur. Re Re reservation? he said weakly. Yes, sir, said the green blur. Do you need a, a reservation for the afterlife? In so far as it is possible for a green blur to arch its eyebrows disdainfully, this is what the green blur now did. Afterlife, sir, it said. Arthur Dent was grappling with his consciousness the way one grapples with a lost bar of soap in a bath. Is it is this is this the after is this the afterlife? he stammered. Well, I I assume so, said Ford Prefect, trying to work out which way was up. He tested the theory that it must lie in the opposite direction from the cold, hard shore on which he was lying, and staggered to what he hoped sincerely were his feet. I mean, he said, swaying gently, there's no way we could have survived that blast, is there? No, muttered Arthur. He had raised himself onto his elbows, but it didn't seem to improve things. He slumped down again. No, said Trillian, standing up. No way at all. A dull, hoarse gurgling sound came from the floor. It was Zaphod Beeblebrox attempting to speak. Uh, 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 I, uh, I, uh, I certainly didn't survive, he gurgled. I was, I was a total goner. Wham, bang, and that was it. Yeah, thanks to you, said Ford. We didn't stand a chance. We must have been blown to bits, arms, legs, everywhere. Yeah, said Zaphod, struggling noisily to his feet. If the lady and gentleman would care to order drinks, said the green blur, hovering impatiently beside them. Kerpow! Splat! continued Zaphod, instantaneously zonked into our component molecules. Hey, for it, he said, identifying one of the slowly solidifying blurs around him. Did you get that whole of your life flashing before you thing going on? You, you got that too? said Ford. Your whole life? Yeah, said Zaphod. At least I assume it was mine. 
I spent a lot of time out of my skulls, you know. He looked around him at the various shapes that were at last becoming proper shapes, instead of vague and wobbling shapeless shapes. Just need to cough. <coughs> Excuse me. So, he said. So what? said Ford. So, here we are, said Seyfort hesitantly, lying dead. Standing, Trillian corrected him. Er, uh, standing dead, continued Zaphod, in this desolate... Restaurant, said Arthur Dent, who'd got to his feet, and can now, much to his surprise, see clearly. That is to say, the thing that surprised him was not that he could see, but what he could see. Here we are, continued Zaphod doggedly, standing dead in this desolate five star, said Trillian, restaurant, concluded Zaphod. Odd, isn't it? said Ford. Uh, yeah. Nice chandeliers, though, said Trillian. They looked about themselves in bemusement. It's not so much of an afterlife, said Arthur, more a sort of après vie. The chandeliers were, in fact, a little on the flashy side, and the low vaulted ceiling from which they hung would not, in an ideal universe, have been painted in that particular shade of deep turquoise, and even if it had been, it wouldn't have been highlighted by the concealed moonlighting, mood lighting. This is not, however, an ideal universe, as was further evidenced by the eye-crossing patterns of the inlaid marble floor, and the way in which the fronting for the 80-yard-long marble-topped bar had been made. The fronting for the 80-yard-long marble-topped bar had been made by stitching together nearly 20,000 anterior mosaic lizard skins, despite the fact that the 20,000 lizards concerned had needed them to keep their insides in. A few smartly dressed creatures were lounging casually at the bar, or relaxing in the richly coloured body-hugging seats that were deployed here and there about the bar area. A young Vlahurg officer and his green steaming young lady passed through the large smoked glass doors at the far end of the bar into the dazzling light of the main body of the restaurant beyond. Behind Arthur was a large curtained bay window. He pulled aside the corner of the curtain and looked out at a bleak and drear landscape. Grey, pockmarked and dis dismal, a landscape which under normal circumstances would have given Arthur the creeping horrors. These were not, however, normal circumstances. For the thing that froze his blood and made his skin try to crawl up his back and off the top of his head, was the sky. The sky was... An attendant flunky, sorry, an attendant flunky politely drew the curtain back into place. All in good time, sir, he said. Zaphod's eyes flashed. Hey! Hang about, you dead guys, he said. I think we're missing some ultra-important thing here, you know. Something somebody said, and we missed it. Arthur was profoundly relieved to turn his attention away from what he'd just seen. He said, I said it was a sort of apres. Yeah, and don't you wish you hadn't, said Zaphod. Ford, I said it was odd. Yeah, shrewd but dull. Perhaps it was... Perhaps, interrupted the green blur, who had by this time resolved into the shape of a small, wizened, dark-suited green waiter. Perhaps you would care to discuss the matter over drinks. Drinks! cried Zaphod. That was it! See what you miss if you don't stay alert? Indeed, sir, said the waiter patiently. If the lady and gentleman would care to take drinks before dinner. Dinner, 
exclaimed Zaphod with passion. Listen, little green person, my stomach would care to take you home and cuddle you all night for the mere idea. And the universe, continued the waiter, determined not to be deflected on his home stretch, will explode later for your pleasure. Ford's head swiveled slowly towards him. He spoke with feeling. Wow, he said. What sort of drinks do you serve in this place? The waiter laughed a polite little waiter's laugh. <laughs> I think sir has perhaps misunderstood me. Oh, I hope not, breathed Ford. The waiter coughed a polite little waiter's cough. <clears throat> it is not unusual for our customers to be a little disoriented by the time journey, he said. So, if I might suggest... Time journey, said Zaphod. Time journey, said Ford. Time journey, said Trillian. You mean, this isn't the afterlife? said Arthur. The waiter smiled a polite little waiter's smile. He had almost exhausted his polite little waiter repertoire, and soon would be slipping into his role of rather tight-lipped and sarcastic little waiter. Afterlife, sir? No, sir. And we're not dead? The waiter tightened his lips. Ah, ha, 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 ha. He said, Sir is most evidently alive, otherwise I would not be attempting to serve, sir. In an extraordinary gesture, which it is pointless attempting to describe, Zaphod Beeblebrox slapped both his foreheads with two of his arms and one of his thighs with the other. Hey, guys, he said, this is crazy. We did it. We finally got to where we were going. This is Millieways. Millieways? cried Ford. Yes, sir, said the waiter, laying on the patience with a trowel. This is Millieways, the restaurant at the end of the universe. End of what? said Arthur. In just a few minutes, sir, said the waiter. He took another deep breath. He didn't need to do this since his body was supplied with the peculiar assortment of gases it required for survival from a small intravenous device strapped to his leg. There are times, however, when whatever your metabolism, you have to take a deep breath. Now, if you would care to order your drinks at last, he said, I will then show you to your table. Zaphod grinned two manic grins, sauntered over to the bar, and bought most of it. The restaurant at the end of the universe is one of the most extraordinary ventures in the entire history of catering. It has been built on the fragmented remains of... It will be built on the fragmented... That is to say, it will have been built by this time, and indeed has... One of the major problems encountered in time travel is not that of accidentally becoming your own father or mother. There is no problem involved in being your own father or mother that a broad-minded and well-adjusted family can't cope with. There is also no problem about changing the course of history. The course of history does not change because it all fits together like a jigsaw. All the important changes have happened before the things they were supposed to change, and it all sort of sorts itself out in the end. The major problem is quite simply one of grammar. And the main work to consult in this matter is Dr. Dan Street Mentioner's Time Traveller's Handbook of 1001 Tense Formations, 
It will tell you, for instance, how to describe something that was about to happen to you in the past before you avoided it by time jumping forward two days in order to avoid it. The event will be described differently according to whether you are talking about it from the standpoint of your own natural time, from a time in the further future, or a time in the further past, and is further complicated by the possibility of conducting conversations whilst you are actually travelling from one time to another, with the intention of becoming your own mother or father. Most readers get as far as the future semi-conditionally modified sub-inverted plagial past subjunctive intentional before giving up. And in fact, in later editions of the book, all the pages beyond this point have been left blank to save on printing costs. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy skips lightly over this tangle of academic abstraction, pausing only to note that the term future perfect has been abandoned since it was discovered not to be. To resume, the restaurant at the end of the universe is one of the most extraordinary adventures in the entire history of catering. It is built on the fragmented remains of an eventually ruined planet, which is, we all haven be, enclosed in a vast time bubble and projected forward in time to the precise moment of the end of the universe. This is, many would say, impossible. In it, guests take, willen on take, their places at a table, and eat, willen on eat, sumptuous meals, whilst watching, willing watching, the whole of creation explode around them. That is, many would say, equally impossible. You can arrive, mayen arrivan on when, for any sitting you would like, without prior, late for when, reservation, because you can book retrospectively, as it were, when you return to your own time. You can have on book, have enter for when, presuming returning when to retro home. This, this is, many would not insist, absolutely impossible. At the restaurant you can meet and dine with. Mayan meetan con with dinan on when, a fascinating cross section of the entire population of space and time. This it can be explained patiently, is also impossible. You can visit it as many times as you like. Mayan on visit on re on visiting, and so on. For further tense correction, consult Dr. Street Mentioner's book, please. And be sure of never meeting yourself because of the embarrassment this usually causes. This, even if the rest were true, which it isn't, is patently impossible, say the doubters. All you have to do is deposit one penny in a savings account in your own era, and when you arrive at the end of time, the operation of compound interest means that the fabulous cost of your meal has been paid for. This, many claim, is not merely impossible, but clearly insane which is why the advertising executives of the star system Bastablon came up with this slogan. If you've done six impossible things this morning, why not round it off with breakfast at Millieways, the restaurant at the end of the universe? At the bar, Zephod was rapidly becoming as tired as a newt. His heads knocked together and his smiles were coming out of sync. He was miserably happy. Zephod, said Ford, whilst you're still capable of speech, would you care to tell me what the photon happened? Where have you been? Where, where have we been? Small matter, but I'd like it cleared up. Zephod's left head sobered up. 
leaving his right to sink further into the obscurity of drink. Yeah, he said, I've been around. They want me to find the man who rules the universe, but I don't care to meet him. I believe the man can't cook. His left head watched his right head saying this, and then nodded. True, it said. And I'll drink. Ford had another pangalactic gargle blaster. The drink which has been described as the alcoholic equivalent of mugging, expensive and bad for the head. Whatever had happened, Ford decided he didn't really care too much. Listen, Ford, said Zayford. Everything's cool and fruity. Y you mean everything's under control? No, said Zayford. I do not mean everything's under control. That would not be cool and fruity. If you want to know what happened, let's just say I had the, uh, I had the whole situation in my pocket, okay? Ford shrugged. Zaphod giggled into his drink. It frothed up over the side of the glass and started to eat its way into the marble bar top. Sorry, I've had drinks like that at the pub. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, try that again. Zaphod giggled into his drink. It frothed up over the side of the glass and started to eat its way into the marble bar top. A wild-skinned sky gypsy approached them and played electric violin at them until Zaphod gave him a lot of money and he agreed to go away again. The gypsy approached Arthur and Trillian, sitting in another part of the bar. I don't know what this place is, said Arthur, but I think it gives me the creeps. Have another drink, said Trillian. Enjoy yourself. Which, said Arthur, the two are mutually exclusive. Poor Arthur, you're not really cut out for this life, are you? You call this life? You're beginning to sound like Marvin. Marvin's the clearest thinker I know. How do you think we make this violinist go away? The waiter approached. Your table is ready he said. Seen from the outside, which it never is, the restaurant resembles a giant glittering starfish beached on a forgotten rock. Each of its arms house the bars, the kitchens, the force field generators which protect the entire structure, and the decayed hunk of a planet on which it sits, and the time turbines which slowly rock the whole affair backwards and forwards across the crucial moment. In the centre sits the gigantic golden dome, almost a complete globe, and it was into this area that Zaphod, Ford, Arthur and Trillian now passed. At least five tons of glitter alone had gone into it before them and covered every available surface. The other surfaces were not available because they were already encrusted with jewels, precious seashells from San Traginus, gold leaf, mosaic tiles, lizard skins and a million unidentifiable embellishments and decorations. Glass glittered, silver shone, Gold gleamed, Arthur Dent goggled. Wow, we said Zaphod, Zappo! Incredible, breathed Arthur. The people, the things. The things, said Ford Prefect quietly, are also people. The people? resumed Arthur. The other people? The lights, said Trillian. The tables, said Arthur. The clothes, said Trillian. The waiter thought they sounded like a couple of bailiffs. The end of the universe is very popular, said Zaphod, threading his way unsteadily through the throng of tables some made of marble, some of rich ultramahogany, some even of platinum, and at each a party of exotic creatures chatting amongst themselves and studying menus. People like to dress up for it, continued Zaphod. Gives it a sense of occasion. 
The tables were fanned out in large circles around the central area, where a small band was playing light music. At least a thousand tables was Arthur's guess, and interspersed amongst them were swaying palms, hissing fountains, grotesque statuary. statuary. In short, all the paraphernalia common to the restaurants where little expense had been spared to give the impression that no expense has been spared. Arthur glanced around, half expecting to see someone making an American Express commercial. Zaphod lurched into Ford, who lurched back into Zaphod. Wow, we said Zaphod. Zappo, said Ford. My great granddaddy must have really screwed up the computer's works, you know. I told it to take us to the nearest place to eat, and it sends us to the end of the universe. Remind me to be nice to it one day. He paused. Hey, everyone's here, you know, everyone who was anybody. Was, said Arthur. At the end of the universe, you have to use the past tense a lot, said Zaphod, because everything's been done. You know. Hi, guys, he called out to a nearby party of giant iguana-like life forms. How do you do? Is that Zaphod Beeblebrax? asked one iguana of another iguana. I think so, replied the second iguana. Well, wasn't that just take the biscuit? said the first iguana. Funny old thing, life, said the second iguana. It's what you make it, said the first. And then they lapsed back into silence. They were waiting for the greatest show in the universe. Hey, Zaphod, said Ford, grabbing for his arm and on account of the third pan-galactic gargle blaster miss missing. He pointed a swaying finger. There's, there's an, old <clears throat> an old mate of mine, he said. Hot black desiato. See the man at the platinum table with the platinum suit on. Zaphod tried to follow Ford's finger with his eyes, but it made him feel dizzy. Finally, he saw. Oh, yeah, he said. Then recognition came a moment later. Hey, he said. Did that guy ever make it mega big? Wow, bigger than the biggest thing ever. Other than me. Who's he supposed to be? asked Trillian. Hot black Desiato? said Zaphod in astonishment. You, you don't know? You never heard of Disaster Area? No, said Trillian, who hadn't. The biggest, said Ford. Loudest. Richest, suggested Zaphod. Rock band in the history of... Ford searched for the word. History itself, said Zaphod. No, said Trillian. Zowie, said Zaphod. Here we are at the end of the universe, and you haven't even lived yet. Did you miss out? He led her off to where the waiter had been waiting all this time at the table. Arthur followed them, feeling very lost and alone. Ford waded off through the throng to renew an old acquaintance. Hey, uh, Hot Black, he called out. How you doing? Great to see you, big boy. How's the noise? You're looking great. Really, very, very fat and unwell. Amazing. He slapped the man on the back and was mildly surprised that it seemed to elicit no response. The pan-galactic gargle blasters, blasters sw swilling around inside him, told him to plunge on regardless. Ha, remember the old days, he said. We used to hang out, right? The Bistro Illegal, remember? Slim's Throat Emporium? The Evil Drone Boozerama? Great days, eh? Hot Black Desiato offered no opinion as to whether they were great days or not. Ford was not perturbed. And when we were hungry, we would pose as public health inspectors. You remember that? And go around confiscating meals and drinks, right? Till we got food poisoning. Ah, oh, and then there were the long nights of talking and drinking in those smelly rooms above the Café Lou in Gretchen Town, New Bethel. And you were always in the next room trying to write songs on your adratar, and we all hated them. 
And you said you didn't care, and we said we did because we hated them so much. Paul's eyes were beginning to mist over. And you said you didn't want to be a star, he continued, wallowing in nostalgia, because you despise the star system. And we said, Hadra, Suliju and me, and we said that we didn't think you had the option. What do you do now? You buy star systems. He turned and solicited the attention of those at nearby tables. Here, here he said, here, here's a man who buys star systems. Hot Black Desiato made no attempt either to confirm or deny this fact, and the attention of the temporary audience waned rapidly. I think someone's drunk, muttered a purple bush-like being into his wine glass. Ford staggered slightly and sat down heavily on the chair facing Hot Black Desiato. What's, what's that number you do? he said, unwisely, unwisely grabbing at a bottle for support and tipping it over into a nearby glass as it happened. Not to waste a happy accident, he drained the glass. That really huge number, he continued. How does it go? Blam, blam, better, something. And in the stage act you do, it, it, oh yeah, it ends up with this ship crashing right into the sun. <laughs> you actually do it. Ford crashed his fist into his other hand to illustrate this feat graphically. He knocked the bottle over again. Ship, son, wham, bam, he cried. I mean, forget lasers and stuff. You guys are into solar flares and real sunburn. Oh, and terrible songs. His eyes followed the stream of liquid glugging out of the bottle onto the table. Something ought to be done about that, he thought. Hey, you, you want a drink? he said. It began to sink into Hill's squelching mind that something was missing from this reunion, and that the missing something was in some way connected with the fact that the fat man sitting opposite him in the platinum suit and the silvery trilby had not yet said, Hi, Ford, or Great to see you after all this time, or, in fact, anything at all. More to the point, he had not yet even moved. Hot black? said Ford. A large, meaty hand landed on his shoulder from behind and pushed him aside. He slid gracelessly off his seat and peered upwards to see if he could spot the owner of this discourteous hand. The owner was not hard to spot, on account of his being something of the order of seven feet tall and not slightly built with it. In fact, he was built the way one builds leather sofas, shiny, lumpy, and with lots of very solid stuffing. The suit into which the man's body had been stuffed looked as if its only purpose in life was to demonstrate how difficult it was to get this sort of body into a suit. The face had the texture of an orange and the colour of an apple, but there the resemblance to anything sweet ended. Kid, said a voice, which emerged from the man's mouth as if it had been having a really rough time down in his chest. Uh, yeah? said Ford conversationally. He staggered back to his feet and was disappointed that the top of his head didn't come further up the man's body. Beat it, said the man. Oh, yeah, said Ford, wondering how wise he was being. A and who are you? The man considered this for a moment. He wasn't used to being asked this sort of question. Nevertheless, he came up with an answer after a while. 
I'm the guy who's telling you to beat it, he said, before you get it beaten for you. Now, listen, said Ford a little nervously. He wished his head would stop spinning, settle down and get to grips with the situation. Now, listen, he continued. I am one of Hotblack's oldest friends and... He glanced at Hotback Desiato, who still hadn't moved so much as an eyelash. And, said Ford again, wondering what would be a good word to say after and. The large man came up with a whole sentence to go after and. He said it. And I am Mr. Desiato's bodyguard, it went, and I am responsible for his body. And I am not responsible for yours. So, take it away before it gets damaged. Now, wait a minute, said Ford. No minutes, boomed the bodyguard. No waiting. Mr. Desiato speaks to no one. Well, perhaps you'd let him say what he thinks about the matter himself, said Ford. He speaks to no one, bellowed the bodyguard. Ford glanced anxiously at Hot Black again and was forced to admit to himself that the bodyguard seemed to have the facts on his side. There was not the slightest sign of movement, let alone keen interest in Ford's welfare. Why, said Ford, what's the matter with him? The bodyguard told him. <laughs> we'll get on to that next time. <laughs> Okay, it is 23 minutes past 10 uh, in Central Europe. That's a good moment, I think, to to uh, call a halt. Leave you in suspense for next week's episode. Or, uh, so we'll find out why Hot Black Desiato isn't speaking and all that. What? Uh, yes, so we'll call it a day for, for this evening. Thank you so much. As all joining me, you fabulous, fabulous, fabulous people. Um, I will be back uh, on Sunday, May the 3rd, I think that is, at uh, 2100 uh, European time. Uh, thanks so much for your company again this evening. You are all marvellous. Um, spread the word. Uh, get the word out there. Um, as I say, I will be converting these all into podcasts as well to make it even easier for people going forwards if you want to recap or listen to them ever again, which uh, you might do. I don't know. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for this evening. As always, it's always a pleasure. Uh, look after yourself. Stay hoopy, stay fruity. Um, remember where your towel is. Uh, and uh, see you in a week's time. Bye, guys. Thanks ever so much. See ya. <laughs>